All right. Thank you, Brian. So, good morning, everybody. And I hope everybody had a chance to watch Graham's keynote. Um, I thought there was some excellent advice in there and some good themes that actually, so we, we worked together a long time ago at Sophos, and so um, somehow I guess we tend to think alike, because some of the themes you're going to hear about in my presentation do align with what Graham was talking about today. Um, so a bit of background, yeah, I work uh, in the field CTO office uh, specializing in threat intelligence for a group called Sophos XOps, and this is the group that brings together all the different research arms. Our CTO calls it like the Avengers of the research within the company, right? So we've got Sophos AI, we've got MDR and IR, and we've got our labs, and we've got all sorts of other people contributing data and knowledge to this pool that we use to then inform the public and ourselves, obviously, about you know, what we need to protect against. And I'm sort of at the nexus of all that and trying to understand, well, what, what are the things that we can learn from all this that then can inform defense, that can inform the public about how maybe we're doing things a little bit worse than we should be, or maybe there's some things that we're doing well and we got to call those out as well. Um, and so this particular talk is going to be focused mostly on IR and MDR, so incident response investigations data and MDR data, so managed detection and response data. Uh, I, I write a report every year called the Active Adversary Report, which is very much takes all that information, summarizes it, and, and quant quantifies the things that we can about the attacks that are happening in the real world to real victims uh, of you know, organizations all over the world. Um, There's going to be a, a sprinkling of data from uh, this global survey that we do of 5,000 respondents every year, which sort of provides a bit of balance from the you know, kind of the objective, this is what we saw in the real world in, in attacks versus this is what we're asking people how they feel and, and what they, they're seeing in terms of security. Uh, threat report, our managed risk service, uh, our device exposure feature, right? There's a lot of stuff that goes into forming this picture. And so I, I'm not going to bury the lead here. I'm going to tell you right away what the Holy Trinity is. And we were so, after doing this report for five years, there was something that just kept jumping out. Well, there was three things, because it's a trinity, that kept jumping out at me over and over and over again. And that was, uh, that, that was why I focused on this. And it, it was so pre predominant that we decided to put it in the form of a haiku. So here it is. Time and time again, I'm seeing these mistakes if not all three of them together, that are leading to breaches, that are leading to organizations getting ransomware, that are leading to organizations having to pay millions of dollars in recovery costs, that are leading organizations to sometimes, and it has happened, shut their doors, as Graham had said this morning. And it may seem obvious. You guys say, come on, John, we know this, right? We know you have to do this stuff, but I've seen the dead bodies of organizations everywhere that have fallen prey to these things, they thought they knew it too. They just didn't know how important it was to address these things. And what I'm going to attempt to do is I'm going to attempt through data to show you why I've come to this conclusion and then hopefully give you some tips along the way that can prevent maybe your organizations from falling prey to this stuff. So let's talk about just the threat landscape as it stands from the lens of mostly MDR and IR data. If we look at the attack types, the things that we see, we're seeing the top line is ransomware, the second line is network breaches, so you know somebody got in that wasn't supposed to, but we don't know what the actual objective was. And then the bottom lines are basically everything else, right? Things like coin miners, data exfiltration, and data extortion. The difference between those is one of them asks for money after they steal your data, the other one just walks away with it and you never hear from them again. Uh, loaders, wipers, DDoS, web shells, all that kind of stuff. But you can see ransomware obviously rules the roost when it comes to the attack types that we see within IR, incident response investigations. It's probably, again, no surprise, right? IR, this is when you need help. You really, you're in trouble. You need some experts to come in to help you recover and remediate. And ransomware is just one of those crimes that when it hits, it can hit pretty hard and, and cause quite widespread damage. Um, if we look in contrast to the state of ransomware survey, which again is polling organizations, they sit at around 66%, right? So you can see I'm hovering around 70%. They're saying, you know, organizations are responding to us saying, we're seeing about 66% of, of the things that are hitting us is ransomware. And so they're fairly even, and it's, it's anywhere from, I'd say, I always say, th you know, two-thirds to three-quarters of attacks are generally going up in ransomware if you let them go 
all the way to the end. Now let's look at the root causes, right? The why uh, that these attacks are happening. And so the, the, the two real important ones there are the green and the purple bars, right? So you can see the purple bars are exploiting vulnerabilities as a root cause to the attack, whereas the green bars are compromised or stolen credentials. However they got compromised, it doesn't matter. The bad guys have your username and password or a username and password, and they're using it to waltz right in the front door. Um, so exploits are on the descending trend for this set of years, right? Whereas compromised creds are ascending. Now, it doesn't... And if you look at the all-time stats, it's about even, right? So exploiting vulnerabilities is 30% and compromised credentials is 33%. And it's not that they're favoring one over the other. It's just when you kind of ebb and flow through time, sometimes there's not as many exploits that are trivial to use. And you're going to rely on this vast barrel full of compromised credentials that you have. And you're going to use those instead because guess what? They still work as well because of, obviously, the lack of MFA that I stated in, in the, uh, the, the opening haiku. And then the, the one that's mostly a problem is the unknown, right? So unknown is 18% all time, meaning we couldn't tell you how or why or what happened. Well, we, we know what happened, but like the initial stages of the attack, we couldn't tell you because you couldn't tell us, right? You didn't have the telemetry, you, and, and that for various reasons, right? But, that's something that, again, I think if I could have a fourth one in that haiku, it might be let's get rid of unknowns, right? Because that is how we can then inform the steps that we take after an attack, even if it's just a network breach, so that it doesn't happen again. If we look at labs, so SOFOS detections, right? This is from our threat report. You can see that the very top line, almost 50%, spyware, key loggers, info stealers, basically the things that go after credentials. That's the number one thing that we're finding in terms of detections. And these are precursors to attacks, right? If you kind of break it down into a few buckets, you've got generally the, the you know, initial access brokers that are dealing with info stealers that are getting the credentials, which then lead to the middle bit of the attack, which is usually droppers and backdoors. And then finally, the culmination is generally in 66 to 75 percent cases, ransomware, right? And that makes sense that we would see that in descending order because, you know, we try to block everything really at the first stage wherever possible. So you're, you, we're starting to see some ties here with respect to how these things work together with respect to the root causes, with respect to the attack types, and with respect to the detections that we're seeing. Then there's dwell time. So dwell time is the time between when an attack starts and when you notice something, right? So it's, it's that delta. And we've seen it crash pretty much in the last few years. It's gone down dramatically for, you know, if you look at the top is the non-ransomware attacks and the bottom is the ransomware attacks. And the median dwell time um, has gone down quite dramatically for the non-ransomware attacks, right? As has the, uh, the ransomware attacks. But there seems to be a bit of a speed limit here when it comes to the adversaries, right? They can only go so fast in the network. They're, they're gen I have seen some in hours, don't get me wrong. Some of these guys, they're either that well rehearsed, they've been doing this for, well, you know, ransomware operators have been doing this for 10 years, right? Uh, CryptoLocker was uh, turned 10, I think, September of last year. Um, and so they've been doing this for a long time. They're well practiced. They've got playbooks. When Conti leaks happened, you saw the playbooks got leaked, right? They told you exactly these are the steps you need to do. But they're rarely going to be able to get down to zero because doing what they need to do does take time. We can make it go to zero. The sooner we detect, the sooner we mount a response, the sooner we kick these guys on the network, the shorter that dwell time. So that gives us a bit of an indication that all is not lost. There is time to be able to detect things in the network and do something about it before it gets bad. But there are certain things that are more pressing than others. If we look at the totality of events in 2023, and I just basically said, okay, count all the dwell times and rank them, fully 50% are happening in nine days or fewer. Okay, so that gives us now a bit more time. But that includes a lot of the, you know, the non-ransomware stuff, so it inflates the number a little bit. But there's a long tail there, right? You can see one at the end, 960 days. That was a particularly interesting one, right? Uh, so for three years, there were attackers in the network that didn't belong there. But what they, what they are adamant about, the cyber criminals, is getting to Active Directory, right? In 15 hours, 
on average, so that's the median time, sorry, uh, the attackers are going straight for Active Directory because why? It's the crown jewels, right? As Graham said in this, in this keynote. That is one of the assets, it's the most powerful asset in most networks. And can, you can leverage that to do the most damage. And so protecting Active Directory seems like it'd be the most important thing to do, yet we come in with you know, our investigative teams for incident response investigations. And often, what the one server that's missing protection is Active Directory because we don't want security to get in the way of the most important asset in our network, so we're just not going to protect it. That's some baffling logic, but it happens more often than not. And you know, many orgs monitor for things like new domain admins or domain admins logging into uh, non-DC assets, but you know, how many organizations are monitoring for things like the activation and setting of new passwords for like previously deactivated domain admins? These are some of the things you can do from a detection engineering and just a telemetry standpoint that give you indications that something's happening in your, net, in your network at the very beginning of the attack, right, within that 15 hour time period, that can then reduce that dwell time as close to zero as possible. And then there's things like just-in-time access and uh, privileged identity management, I think it's called. Or the, there's a bunch of things within Entra ID now that allow you to actually restrict how and when domain admins and global admins interact with your network. There's another thing that we've seen, and this is very much aimed at the servers again, because the, if you don't put on a, let's say, an EDR product and you rely just on Defender, because that's kind of what's running by default, uh, the criminals have a, a field day with this. They, they've gotten quite adept at disabling Defender. And you can see over time, they're getting you know, much better at it and, and more, uh, more consistent with disabling protection. There's an event ID 5001 in the event logs that's real-time protection is disabled. So obviously, you're going to want to monitor for that, right? If, if, if you're monitoring, if your SOC is monitoring for suspicious things, that's probably one of the ones you want to monitor for. But there's also another one called event ID 5000, which is real-time protection is enabled. Why would you care about real-time protection being enabled? Well, if you have Sophos or CrowdStrike or Sentinel-1 or somebody else that is the endpoint protection product on that asset, and the criminals come in with an EDR killer, which is all the rage these days, well, they're going to kill your product, but then Defender's going to start right up again, because it's going to go, there's no protection in this box, I'm going to spin up Defender just in case. So that is another one of these things that you can use in your telemetry to try to detect that something's gone on. And, and the need to investigate that is probably quite high. I see it all the time when I'm looking at investigative uh, timelines of logs, of event logs. I can see, you know, defender enabled, defender enabled, defender enabled. And it's because they're doing something else that's causing the other security in the device to, uh, to go sideways. As far as unprotected devices go, well, we always see, you know, You've heard of a, the developer's you know, workstation under the desk and you know, they're, they're just working on a little project over here and yeah, it's fine. It, it's not on the production network, so it, it'll be fine, right? So there's devices like that, but there's also devices on the network that maybe can't be protected. You know, you've got certain like, things like NASs, right? These, and in a lot of small organizations, they use consumer-grade stuff. That can be used to launch ransomware, and the criminals know this. So they, they use these as, as sort of launching off points for ransomware, and we're seeing a quite dramatic increase over the last uh, two years of them using these hosts that can't have protection or have been deliberately left unprotected or accidentally left unprotected, and they're using those to launch the ransomware. They don't actually encrypt the device itself. They encrypt all the other devices that are in the network. And then finally, you know, there's the logs unavailable, the, the unknown stuff, right? Like, we go into these investigations trying to help people recover and trying to help them understand what happened, and we get nothing. Now, obviously, protection disabled is, is a problem, and they are clearing logs, but the number one cause of us sometimes not being able to understand what's happening in the network is you didn't give us the logs. They rolled too quickly, or in, there was one MSP that I was... Uh, analyzing that basically had set all the firewall logging for all their customers to zero, right? They just weren't going to collect them. 
And maybe that's because they didn't have the resources or the, the disk or whatever, but that's not how you do it, right? So that sort of sets the stage. And I just thought I'd put this back up here again just to remind us, what, what is it that we need to focus on? Because now I'm going to give you some more specific evidence and advice on how these three are particularly harming organizations. Because the fact is that even though you know, I'm hammering on this, these aren't universally adopted by all organizations. And I just keep seeing them time after time after time impacting real victims of ransomware and other threats. So let's talk about RDP first. Well, RDP. So when I look at the living off the land, so the Microsoft binaries that get used the most in attacks, you know, I've stack ranked them here for the last couple of years. RDP is consistently number one. When I actually started doing this report, I omitted RDP because I'm like, it's just so, and, and command.exe, because I'm like, it's just going to be part of all the attacks. I don't need to talk about it, right? And then it turns out that I do need to talk about it because not enough people are doing anything about it. But so it's consistently number one. The list barely ever changes, right? Um, as far as the RDP in 2024, so I've, I've just started analyzing the first half of 2024. Uh, it's 84% right now, so nearly, and, and nearly an identical list. The only two that change are like things like who am I and NL test. They're actually usually, and you know, I said top 10, but like I, I had to include an 11th one just so that the lists kind of matched a little bit. But those are the two that, that show up um, as well as part of, of those, those top tools. And you can see some familiar tools on there, right? They're setting uh, tasks for uh, launching their payloads, they're using PSExec as, as a kind of poor person's deployment tool. Uh, they're using net to, and NL test to do re recon on the network. So all very use, useful tools. But RDP is, is the most useful tool, ar arguably, because if we look at the last two years, you know, 90% of attacks involved in some way, shape, or form RDP in the last year. And if we break it down from internal use versus external use, so internal use I think, again, it's no surprise, right? 86%, 90%. Once you're in the network, man, it's great, right? You can just start zipping around everywhere you go using RDP with largely you know, unimpeded access to anything, including servers. Uh, but the external access is the one that's quite concerning, right? This is, this is people that put RDP on the internet on purpose for whatever reason. And you'd say, well, that can't be that bad, right? Well, this is a screenshot I took not too long ago, you know, on Shodan. 4.1 million exposed RDP machines. Well, okay, so how many millions or hundreds of millions of computers are there in the world? But yeah, how many of these, like, th to me this is like if you see one rat, mouse, cockroach, ant, pick your pest, there's more, right? So getting into one of these gives you access to how many more machines behind it. And oftentimes, there is no additional security other than that username and password field, right? There's no rate limiting for brute force. There's no 2FA. There's nothing in terms of segregating network access beyond it. It's just you get in, and now the network is at your disposal. And you can't hide, right? I'm gonna, I know. I'll change the port to 3388. The criminals aren't going to know that, right? Of course they are. Right? All these scans can give you the remote desktop protocol regardless of what port it's operating on. And this is just me literally doing that, just going, show me remote desktop protocol. And you can see all sorts of service you know, numbers, right? 21902 and 60, oh, 63389. So we'll put a 6 in front of the, the natural port, and that'll get them, right? But you can't hide. There, there are too many tools out there that will reveal the fact that there is an exposed RDP machine on the network. And so let, let's look at a case study because I think this starts to show and, 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 and it is a pretty egregious one. I'll give you that as we go through it. You'll, you'll see what I mean. But it shows the damage that can be done if you are, well, I don't know if we're going to call it incompetence or not. but if you're not doing the right thing. So in December 2022, we had a case where uh, the initial access involved uh, brute forcing multiple exposed RDP ports. And then they leveraged uh, things like PowerSploit and Rubius to compromise authentication further before they dropped a number of binaries, including an EDR killer tool. 
Now, we, this, was, this was found through our MDR service. So we responded quickly, we contained the threat, and we said, all right, you need to do something about this. There's exposed ports all over the place. There's machines all over the place. You need to restrict access. And they said, no, we have business needs for RDP. I'm like, okay, fine. But we're like, you really need to close all the other ports as well that might be contributing to issues. And so you know, strongly take our advice, because we don't want this to happen to you again. And then we also said, hey, you should do a domain-wide credential reset. And they decide, nah, that's too difficult. Um, and then we also said, oh, by the way, you've got some unpatched machines. They're like, OK. So in July of 2023, initial access was achieved through a brute force attack of RDP. You've heard this before, right? So not too long later, right, six months, seven months, they get another attack. And again, they're bringing in their own tools, they, you know, the PA exec tool, NL tests, you know, to enumerate the, uh, the domain controllers within the estate. Um, they moved laterally. They started modifying registry values to other machines that didn't have RDP enabled to make sure that it was enabled to give them further access to these machines. Uh, they also enabled the, uh, you know, the uh, remote assistance requests and they disabled the network layer authentication. So they did, the criminals did everything they could to give themselves you know, the hot knife through butter uh, access to, to RDP in the network. And again, we, re re we reiterated, hey guys, like we've caught these guys again, we've stopped them, we've contained them, you really, really need to close those exposed RDP ports. And you probably should think about if you're not, we get business needs, yeah, okay, but maybe think about doing multi-factor authentication. Um, and they said, eh, maybe. So December 2023, again, Initial access through RDP. Again, brute force attack against RDP. And the, the script is the same here. They're moving around the network. They're dropping their own tools. Uh, they are discovering other employee portals that don't have MFA. They are doing all sorts of stuff that you know, the attackers do. And, and we persistently told them, like, OK, we get your business requirements, but if if you don't address some of these things that we're telling you, this is going to keep happening over and over again. It's already happened three times, and so two weeks later, of course, it happens again, right? So <laughs> this is where the timeline ends for me. I, I, at this point, I don't know how the customer is doing at this point because we just said, listen, we've given you our recommendations. We're going to continue to protect you, but th there's nothing we can't do if you don't participate in your own rescue, right? And risk acceptance is within every organization's purview. But when you're accepting risk that leaves you this wide open, you might want to rethink the things that you're doing. So I'm not suggesting that anybody in here is at this level. But there are things in your environment maybe that you've accepted as a risk that maybe you could do a little bit better. So shifting gears a little bit. So that was pretty egregious, I know. That was a, a, a case that I think is the potentially the worst case, but it's not the only one. I, I see this over and over again with attackers coming in multiple times after we've given them the reasons for not coming in, for, for uh, why they came in and, and how to stop them, and it's, it happens more times than I care to see. So let's look at somebody who tried to do it a little bit better. They tried to use an RD web gateway. They thought, okay, well, at least we'll kind of funnel things through one choke point, and maybe you can start adding you know, network ACLs and, and being a little bit more uh, careful about how you gave access. And um, So this comes from uh, some real world cases as well. And what happens is when you have servers that aren't adequately protected but being exposed to the internet, they can lead to abuses like this. So if you expose the RD web gateway, but you say, okay, well, we're only gonna publish applications, right? Instead of giving you session host access. Well, it doesn't take much because now if I brute force my way in or if I use compromised credentials, I walk through the front door, I can actually use that to my advantage. I don't have session host access. I've got this, uh, this application, but what happens when you click on that, an RDP connection file is actually uh, downloaded and then it will have, it be pre-configured to launch the calculator. But what we can do now is we can try to figure out how, a way how to jailbreak out of this and it's actually quite trivial. So one technique that we've seen repeatedly in our uh, MDR telemetry is to abuse the built-in Windows accessibility functionality. So if you mash the shift key five times, then you get this pop-up for sticky keys. 
and it says, you know, do you want to, uh, do you want to, uh, do you want to turn up, uh, turn on the accessibility features? And so, you, of course, you say yes, which generally leads you to the accessibility options in the control panel. But Windows being so helpful, it has the search bar at the top, right, for Windows Explorer. And so, if you go up in there, you can actually tell it to launch command.exe, and now you've got session host access, right? And this is how the criminals, even when you're trying to do the right thing by maybe limiting some exposure, just the fact that you've got a footprint on the internet and you've got something that isn't rate limited, isn't, doesn't have MFA, leads to things like this, which then lead to things like this, right? So NL test, right? Trying to enumerate the domain, using net to enumerate domain users. Uh, basically just grabbing PowerShell, or using PowerShell to go grab additional payloads and dump them on that session host. So um, the attackers are pretty clever. They, they know how to get around these things quite easily. And that's, to me, why we really need to do something with RDP. Because if you do leave it open, it will get abused. There, there's no it might, it could, it, it will. Full stop. And when we look at RD web access logs, for a lot of these victims, we see time and time and time again just these brute force attempts, right? All right, so let's talk a little bit about multi-factor authentication, the second of the Holy Trinity. I was uh, surfing through Mastodon the other day, and I just <laughs> yesterday, and I, I saw this, and I thought, oh, this is brilliant. And, and Rob Joyce, is, his meme game has been, he's the former uh, uh, head of the, the hacking group of the NSA, um, but he's, his meme game is pretty strong for, uh, he, I guess he's calling Cyber Meme Tober or something like that. But I saw this, I'm like, yeah, I, I agree with all that, right? Passwords are hard to remember, so let's make sure that we, you, you make it easy for your constituents, you know, your users, your employees, whatever, to not reuse passwords and to use unique and, and strong passwords on every site. And yes, of course, you use MFA, but here's the thing, right? If you have MFA, if you have strong MFA, phishing resistant MFA, if you will. Even if they do reuse the passwords, it's still enough friction to often stop the criminals dead in their tracks. So I'm not suggesting that you allow people to reuse passwords, but I'm saying at least there's, some, there's another technology there that's existed for a long time that can help you. Let's talk about initial access for a second. So back to looking at you know, the, uh, the IR investigations of 2023, we talked about the why, the root causes of attacks. Now we're going to talk about the how. So how they got in. And the top two are external remote services and exploiting a public facing application. So those two together are interesting because obviously if you're talking remote services, it's not just RDP, but it's also VPN devices. And it's already invoking thoughts of compromised credentials in your head, I'm thinking, right? Um, they usually require valid accounts, of, but sometimes vulnerabil vulnerabilities are involved. And again, you know, multi-factor does make most of that first column, it makes it go away. What about the second column? Well, sometimes vulns are involved, like I said. And there's actually just this morning I read a story about a vendor um, that has a specific vulnerability that is leading to a dumping of creds of their edge devices which are being stored in plain text. So guess what that now leads to, right? So you're gonna dump all those creds and you're just gonna start spraying the internet with valid credentials, hoping you get some kind of hit, right? This is how these two things can actually work together. And again, this is how if we start to get rid of one, we start to, we start to like chip away at the others. And if we look at the rest of them, like phishing, for example, well, obviously that's, that's part of compromised creds, is it not? Right? It's, it's leading to that loss of credentials, it's leading to that easy win for the cyber criminals. We've got things like trusted relationships and supply chain compromise. To me, they're somewhat the same, but this is MITRE speak, right? And they, they distinguish between the two. Uh, but those often, again, involve compromised credentials. So, as a matter of fact, this whole chart could probably be flattened a little bit if we only took care to protect our credentials the way they should be protected. If you need more evidence, you know, I've got some stats here from previous reports as well as Verizon. The Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, of which we are a proud contributor, also states that credentials, including phishing and exploit vulnerabilities, are the top three concerns in how people are getting into organizations. So if you, 
if you don't trust me, maybe you trust Verizon. I don't know. But this is, you know, tens of thousands of, of data points that are being aggregated for the Deber that are pointing to the same conclusions that I have in my little special report, right? If we look at the first half of 2024, I did a quick crunch of the numbers. Compromised creds, well, ex exploits was at 26%. Compromised creds, 62%. So for, three, for, for the second year running, you know, we're talking over 50%, and for three years, it just continues to rise. And I think a lot of that is due to the success of many info stealers out there today, and the amount of, uh, of, of breaches that are using old passwords and trying them in new places. We talked about speed earlier. Um, one of the things that they're also doing in terms of trying to stay under the radar is they want to strike when you're not looking. So we can see here that you know most attacks happen in off hours and that's adjusted for local time. And almost you know half of those are happening on weekends. And there's a way of dealing with this, right? We can restrict uh, time of access for some credentials and some services, but really the problem is people aren't watching. We're about to release a skills gap report that I pulled out a couple stats specifically. It's not published yet. I, I think it's going to publish maybe next week. But one of the things that stuck, stuck out to me is when we're looking at this kind of thing is that there are a lot of orgs where literally no one is watching. 33% of the organizations surveyed said they don't look at their logs. They, they just don't have the, whatever reason, they don't have the, the resources, the capacity, they just, the logs and they just don't look at them. And then when it comes to those that are watching and are spotting suspicious events, well, in that case, 96%, and this is mostly in the SMB, but which, if you think about it, is most of the businesses worldwide, um, they find that even just investigating suspicious alerts are incredibly challenging. So again, you know, capacity and, and, uh, and, and resources are coming into play here. And then finally, if they do find something suspicious and they investigate it, uh, three quarters of them were finding that remediating malicious alerts and incidents is too timely and way too challenging. So I'm hearing a lot of people kind of screaming for help, right? And this is where the people in this room, people like us, the people out there at the tables, right, can help. You need to come ask and ask for help. But the cyber criminals have our number. They, they know, like, they clear our logs, they blind us with telemetry by disabling antivirus, and then they act when they know we're not watching and when they think we're asleep. And if we look at the cases that I investigated, 43% in 2023 just did not have multi-factor authentication, right? So uh, it, I would say, you know, as we get closer to the future, these numbers tend to get better. Well, in this case, in 2024, it's 58%. So we're still in this mess of lack of MFA, compromised credentials, leading to rapid and devastating compromise. Now, speaking of portals, I kind of mentioned earlier where you know, they, they found these employee portals. One of our uh, managed risk services looks for things like that. And what we found in those scans, and this, I'm not talking about vulnerabilities now, I'm talking about just we found a thing on your external surface that is pinging and, and alive, right? Um, this is customers with one or more portals they didn't know about hanging out on the internet. Seven in 10 customers have something that is just sitting there with a username and password prompt. And I would hazard a guess it's probably close to 100% of them do not have MFA. These are things like switches. These are things like NASs. There are all sorts of different devices that probably by default just have the web portal enabled and maybe you didn't know. This is actually one customer said to us, he says, I've been here at this company for 11 years and I've never seen that portal before in my life. They had no idea that that thing was on the internet. And if you look at things internally, we're seeing something similar in terms of vulnerabilities, which I'll cover next, which is devices that just aren't being updated, right? We're seeing consistently through our device exposure feature that, you know, six months, a year, one device had been unprotected for 1,501 days. 
That's how long it had not taken an update. And the customer just didn't know. So let's talk about vulnerabilities. And I, this is a, a bit of a, the beginning of a, of a research project that I'm undertaking right now that I'm hoping to do a talk on it later once I finish the research. But I've got some preliminary things. Because when I was thinking about vulnerabilities and you know, the, the whole patching bit, the, the third part of the trinity, I'm like, how can, I, how can I drive home the message that they're, it's not the big bad zero days you need to worry about? Sure, you need to worry about them, right? Like, they're devastating when they happen, and they, the criminals use them. But when you use a zero day, you burn it, and so they have very limited shelf life. So in uh, the, the for 2023 and the first half of 2024, uh, 17 different vulnerabilities were found. This is sort of my, my internal, like, sort of, you know, as I note these down, so it's not the official names, but uh, you can see some of them over here. Um, 46 were uh, used in uh, 2003 and, and 12 of them in 2004 so far, which uh, equates to 30% and 24% respectively. Um, and what, what this means is it's not just the stuff that they used to get in, it's even the vulnerabilities that they use while they're in to further their access, to elevate their privilege, do whatever else they need to do. Um, and then what I've done is I've kind of, I wanted to look at the, the delta between when a patch, I'm centering on patches because that's the thing that can protect you, and when an advisory was released, so that's the top graph. And most of the time, advisors and patches, a lot of time, they, they kind of come together, right? Um, they, they, they happen at the same time, but not all the time, right? Sometimes the advisory comes a bit before, uh, and sometimes it comes a little bit a little bit after. Uh, but the median time is zero days, which means that they usually get released together. And then the second graph is the patch uh, and the proof of concept, right? So the publicly available proof of concept, the thing you find on GitHub, right? Not some super secret hacker thing that you had to buy on the dark, dark web. This is available to everybody. And again, here we're seeing that most of the stuff comes after the patch. There's a mean of 31 days or a median of 11 days that after a patch has been released, that's when the POCs come out. Sometimes we see some minus, minuses in there because maybe they get lucky or you know, they had some foreknowledge of something, but um, most often it happens afterwards. And so I took all of that information for all the, uh, the cases that involved exploitation and th this is visually confusing for a reason because I don't necessarily want you to, to, to focus on the actual individual lines. I want you to focus on the stack heights here, right? And the, the axis on the left, which is, those are days after when the POC was launched compared to when the advisory was released, when the patch was released, and when the exploit was released. And you can see here, while there, are some, there is some clustering down at the bottom, it's all over 200 days, right? And the actual median for, let's say, the POC to exploit is 223.5 days. So after an exploit has been publicly POC'd, 223 days later, it still works in a lot of organizations. Now, there's some minuses, right? The little small bars. But um, one of them was due to 3CX. So 3CX was a supply chain compromise. So it kind of makes sense that that one would, have, would precede, let's say, the advisory, at least. Um, and then for some of the maxes, we're seeing like 1,300 days where these devices or these, you know, these, yeah, devices are getting exploited. And one of them is due to this MSI driver that I've, that's the one, one of those things where I find like graphics card drivers and some of these like weird like accelerator uh, CPU overclocking utilities. They ha a lot of them have vulnerabilities and they just never really get patched. I couldn't even find this specific driver on the MSI site despite looking for quite a long time. Uh, I, I just couldn't find it. Um, and then another one is Proxy Shell. And you're saying Proxy Shell, like I was patched in 2021, right? Yeah. But what happens here, I think, with, specifically with Proxy Shell, is when you think about 2021, a lot of people are starting to move to O365, right? They're moving to the cloud. But they had their tenant, they had their on-premise tenant that was running Exchange on the network. What they did was they went to, o, to O365 and like, we're going to leave this thing running over here for a little while just to make sure that that is fine, right? And we're going to decommission that later. We'll get, we'll get back to that later, right? You're not going to get back to that later. Because the minute you go to O365 and it's working, the boss says, all right, now how about that SAP deployment? Or how about this other thing that is a corporate priority that we need you to focus on? And, you know, our memories are fallible, right? We forget about that thing. What could go wrong? 
So it remains unpatched and accessible to the internet, and we're still seeing proxy shell in 2024. Um, one of the ones that I wanted to focus on, it sort of got me started on this, this, this project, was I was noticing a lot of, uh, of, ex of exploitation for this particular CVE, uh, which is for uh, Veeam, not picking on them, it's just, well, the criminals are picking on them, it's not me. Um, but what happens here is when a, a criminal gets into your network, they want to get more access, so what they do is they try to get as many credentials as possible, and they, they can dump them from something that has privilege, and they do. And the problem here is this system has, usually is domain joined, it has, it has a copy of a lot of the credentials and cached, and so there, this vulnerability allows them to extract encrypted credentials, right? So they, they are encrypting them, but this vulnerability allows them to get the plain text out of it. Um, and so what's happening now is the criminals are using this over and over and over again, and specifically for that lateral movement and privilege escalation. And again, I'm seeing median times of like 240 days that are being used with this. So something can be done about this, right? This patch has been around for two-thirds of a year, and yet we're still seeing victims. And, and the, the outcome of the cases that we saw this being used in was 74% of the time it was being used to deploy ransomware. Uh, and usually what they do is they grab domain credentials out of this and then they log into Active Directory and then they use Active Directory to turn off all the other domain admins, to uh, you know, mess with the policies, and very often to just deploy the ransomware if they can. All right, so let's talk about some takeaways and some of the things that maybe we can do to prevent some of this stuff from happening. But before we go, <laughs> just to remind you of the Holy Trinity, right? Close exposed RDP ports, use MFA, and patch vulnerable servers. Nobody said that network defense is easy, but if we had more organizations that took care of these three, we can add some much needed friction to the attackers. This is the soft underbelly that Graham was talking about earlier, right? This is how you reduce your attack surface area, is by limiting these specific three. So there's some key actions, but I want to draw your attention specifically to things like RDP. So you want to monitor for both failed and successful login attempts, right? That telemetry gives you information that can tell you about things going wrong. You want to look for, and Graham mentioned this in his talk, you know, what if somebody's logging in from you know, Florida, but they're really in North Korea. Well, there's something called the time zone bias that shows up in logs for RDP connections. And the time zone bias means it's gonna tell you the delta between the time zone that's set on the machine and your organization. So if they are logging in through Florida, but all of a sudden the time zone says it's you know, North Korean standard time, that's probably time to investigate, right? Look for host names that don't match your corporate standard, right? If you see, if you've got a corporate standard and all of a sudden the default like desktop dash, you know, number comes up, which is the Windows default, that should probably be an alert that goes off in the SOC that causes you to investigate to figure out what's going on, right? And these things are just but a couple things that you can use, you know, tips that you can use from a detection standpoint that will get you closer to that zero dwell time. Yeah, of course, close down the RDP ports. And there's lots of stuff you can do with RDP, right? You can, you can, you can do all sorts of, of restrictions, network restrictions, account restrictions, MFA, all that stuff. I'll leave that to you. That's up to you to figure out how best to do it for your organizations. But, um, but what you can do is implement some of these other little things that are maybe not obvious that will help you detect suspicious activity. Obviously, you want to prefer, prefer phishing-resistant MFA wherever possible, and you want to deploy it wherever possible. If you can't deploy MFA because of legacy network, you know, maybe you've got to rethink your architecture. Maybe you've got to rethink about how things are accessible from even the inside, right? Because the inside is no longer the inside. The inside is the outside, right, as far as criminals are concerned. So think about how maybe you use something like ZTNA, and now I hear you ZTNA, and there's all these other ways of doing that. Enterprise browsers might be the answer for you, right, for some of these things that may not have the capacity to be protected with MFA. And then finally, when it comes to patching, you, know, you want to prioritize your external assets and your servers. 
if nothing else, right? That's what the, that's what the criminals are after. They're, they're going through the, the outside, and then they're going straight for the servers. So at least do that. Or at the bare minimum, maybe you look at the CISA KEV list, the known exploited vulnerabilities list, and just patch those. But, the, but patch something, right? Because 240 days is, is not acceptable for any of us. And again, to quote Graham Cluley, maybe they're not after you, they're after somebody else. And I've seen this again, time and again, in our MDR investigations, that they aren't necessarily interested in the, uh, you know, the florist. They're interested in the florist because the executive from big defense contractor ordered some flowers for his wife, and you know, they can poison the invoice and send it back to him. Kind of a true story. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. But at the end of the day, all of this means you have to be prepared to investigate and you have to be prepared to respond. Because in the immortal words of the late, great godfather of soul, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. So thank you very much for attending the talk. I hope you got something out of this. I hope you go back to your offices and do something about what I've talked to you today. If you want to learn more about just some of the research that we do, <coughs> Sophos XOps, you can find us at news.sophos.com, as well as on uh, infosec.exchange at Sophos XOps. And with that, thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference.